السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. نحمده ونصلي على رسول النبي الكريم. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم. الحمد لله رب العالمين. الرحمن الرحيم. مالك يوم الدين. إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين. إحنا الصراط المستقيم. صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب. ذوب عليهم ولا الضالين آمين قال الله تعالى في شان حبيبي إن الله وملائكته يسلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا سلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل وسلم بارك على سيدنا مولانا محمد طب القلوب ودوائها وعافية الأبدان وشفائها ونور الأبصار وديائها وعلى آله وسهمه دائما أبدا صلاة وسلام عليك يا سيدي يا رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم. We've been talking about and again initially talking about the background. Or things that led up to Karbala. And last week we were talking where Yazid becomes the king and sends word to the governor of Medina Munawwara, uh, Walid, his cousin, that uh, Abdullah ibn Zubair, Abdullah ibn Umar, and Imam Hussein al Islam are to be called and they are to take allegiance with him, otherwise, you know, they should be arrested and killed. And so Abdullah ibn Zubair and Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu anhuma, they both set out as soon as they got word of, of this calling to, to Makkah. And Imam Hussein al-Islam goes and he meets with Walid, you know, and he takes his family with him. But they didn't enter the room and he told them as he was entering the, the room that, you know, when if I stay here unless I raise my voice. And if I raise my voice, then you come in. And so initially, you know, the conversation was very calm. But when he starts to leave, after telling Walid that, you know, he's not going to give allegiance right now. This is not the time to do this. Uh, you know, he'll think about it and, and decide what to do later. But, uh, you know, Marwan, who was there, says to Walid that, you know, if we don't, stop him now, then we will never get hold of him. You know, we need to kill him now, you know, the, or either he gives allegiance or he, or we kill him. And this is when Imam Hussein al-Islam, he says that, raises his voice and he says, you cannot do that. You know, who are you to, to uh, make such an assertion? And the family comes rushing in, you know, situation calms down and they leave. And Imam Hussein al-Islam initially goes to the road of his grandfather, Rasulullah sallallahu and then to the grave of his mother, as well as his brother, and basically says farewell. And he leaves Medina Munawwara, and along with his family, they go to Mecca. There were certain members, as I mentioned last week, there were a few members of his family who were sick and they were in no condition to make the journey and so they are left behind. You know, but just like what will happen in Karbala, you know, they want the blood of Imam Hussein al-Islam. So they don't really care about the rest of it. So this all happens at the end of the month of Rajab, year 60 Hijri. And so Imam Hussein al-Islam arrives in Mecca along with his family, the beginning of Shaban. So he will be there for four months. Shaban, Ramadan, Sawwal, Dilqal. And at the beginning of Dil Hajj he will set out for Karbala. In the meantime, when he arrives in Mecca, of course, you know, the people, many of the people there are very glad to see him. And he's welcomed. And so then, 
you know, but the but the pressure from the kingdom is, or from the state, you know, because the state becomes an entity in itself. And especially when you have unrightful rulers who are really oppressors, you know, they use the state as an excuse to do whatever they want. And that's not something only back then, it's something that's ongoing, even today. And it wasn't something new then either, it was something, you know, you look at throughout the Qur'an when Allah SWT is talking about the kings, you know, who are the kings? Namrud, Fir'aun, all of these kings, you know, all of these, and they're, and they're yes men, Haman, Arun, all of these guys were the yes men to the kings. You rarely do you see a king who is righteous. You know, there is Dhul Qarnayn, and of course among the prophets, but the prophets are prophets, so there's a separate category altogether. So even though Suleiman al-Islam is a king, but he's still a prophet. He is a prophet before he's the king. But if you look at rulers in general, you know, the trend is the majority of them are oppressors. And the more power they think they have, the more oppressive they become. And so when Yazid becomes the king, you know, he's no different than anyone else, other than he will exceed everyone else in his level of oppression. That's, that will be the big difference. The people of Hijaz did not give allegiance to Yazid. Because they're waiting, you know, if any one of these four gives allegiance, Abdullah ibn Umar, Abdullah ibn Zubair, Abdullah ibn Abbas, radiallahu anhum, or Imam Hussein al-Islam, if any of them give allegiance, they will all fall, everyone else will fall in line. And all of these have refused. The people of Iraq, the center stone of which is Kufa, also were refusing to give open allegiance to Yazid. Uh, rather, they, were, they gave this allegiance in reluctance. And so they were looking for a way out. And you have to remember again, Ali Radion, he shifted the capital from Medina Munawara to Kufa. So the people of Kufa are also very familiar with the father of Imam Hussein al-Islam. They are also very familiar with the brother of Imam Hussein al-Islam, Imam Hassan al-Islam, because he remained in Kufa you know, for the six months that he was the Khalifa. So now you start getting letters coming to Imam Hussein al-Islam. Because everybody also realizes that if anybody who truly will oppose Yazid, it will be him. And so they start writing letters that you come here and we will support you. And you get one letter and two letters and three letters, ten letters, twenty letters, hundreds of letters. Many of which are written by very prominent people within Kufa. That you come and we will support you against Yazid. And when he doesn't respond initially, now the letters shift to the tone of, if you don't come, then you will be the one who is responsible if we have to give allegiance to Yazid. And we have to support this tyrant. So as these letters are coming, Imam Hussein al-Islam, he discusses the situation with the family and then he decides to send his cousin, Muslim bin Aqil, radiyan to Kufa, to evaluate the situation. Because everybody is reminding Imam Hussein al-Islam, and of course Imam Hussein al-Islam doesn't need to be reminded, but they're telling him, look, these are the same people you know, who abandoned your father, and the same people who abandoned your brother. So what do you expect from them? Because again, if you remember, when Ali came back after the 
the truce after Safin. You know, and then he wanted to gather the army to go and take care of the situation. These are the same people that said, oh, you know, we're going home and we're not coming back. And they didn't actually say it, they just did it. These are the same people when Imam Hassan al-Islam took them and he decided to, to make the treaty with Mabia, you know, who attacked him. So Imam Hussein Islam says, I know who they are. I know their character. But still, you know, how can I ignore the pleas of those who are being oppressed? So, but still, with the precaution, he still sends Muslim bin Aqil. So he doesn't just say, okay, we're going, or I'm going. He sends Muslim bin Aqil to go and evaluate the situation. The governor in Kufa at this time was a companion of Rasulullah, so it's Noman bin Bashir, radiallahu anhu. Noman bin Bashir, radiallahu was born shortly after Rasulullah came to Medina Munawwar. He's from the Ansar, so from the people of Medina Munawwar. He is the first of the people of Medina Munawwar, or the first male child among the people of Medina Munawwar after Rasulullah came to Medina. So when Rasulullah <coughs> passed, he's roughly 10, 9 or 10 years old. He is the only Ansar who supported Mabiya Radeon in his fight against Ali. As I mentioned way back, you know, several weeks ago, you know, if you look at the Battle of Safin, <coughs> there were only maybe at most a handful of companions who sided with Mabiya Radeon. All of the other companions of Rasulullah so some whether Ansar or Muhajir, or, uh, who, who took place or took part in this battle, sided with Sayyidina Ali, Karam Allah Waj. And so, Mavia Radio had made him governor of Kufa. At this point, he does not oppose the rest of Banu Umayyah. But when Muslim bin Aqil Radio comes and he starts meeting with the people and taking pledges on behalf of Imam Hussein al-Islam, you know, even though he's the governor under Yazid, he does not do anything to stop Muslim bin Aqil. He does not support him, you know, as far as giving him help or doing anything else, but at the same time he does not oppose him. And being the governor, from a state standpoint, this is actually treason, technically. Because you know that these people are, are against the state, and yet you're not doing anything to stop them from being against the state. So, and just like today, no different than yesterday or a hundred years ago or a thousand years ago and it will be no different years from now you always have spies within the state you, know, you always have those loyalists who you know support the state no matter what and so as this process is going on messages are sent to Yazid that look you know, Muslim bin Aqil is here, he's doing all of these things, and the governor's not doing anything to stop him. So what do we do? In the meanwhile, in Kufa itself, Muslim bin Aqil, he goes, he takes pledges, <coughs> people come and they say, yes, we support Imam Hussein al-Islam, and if he comes here, we will support him, and we will, we will give our wealth and our lives for him. And this is the promise, that we will, we will die for him, and we will give whatever we have to for him. Words are cheap. Words have always been cheap. You know, it doesn't take much to move the tongue. You know? And, and the interesting thing, you know, all the other muscles get tired, you know, but the tongue, for some reason, it doesn't get tired. It just keeps going. And you start lifting something, and after you've been lifting it for, for a few minutes, ah, oh, you know, 
You start talking and it doesn't end. And so words are cheap. You know. Words have no meaning if you're not willing to back them up with what you do. This is why even in Islam, you know, this what? Iqrarum bil lisan wa tasdiqum bil qalb. That you accept from the tongue, but you testify to it by your heart. So the actions are the testimony or testify to what you say. You know, if you look at the companions of Rasulullah you know, when they said the kalma, it wasn't simply words. You know, when they said Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluhu sallallahu alaihi wasallam, they understood what what Muhammad Rasulullah meant. And they understood the price for this. You know, if you remember when Rasulullah was about to immigrate, you know, so the Ansar, they came from, at that time, Yathrib to Makkah for Hajj. And they had this secret meeting with Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And when everything is almost finalized, the only person there were at, there weren't even a handful of people who knew about this meeting who weren't directly involved with the meeting. And the only non-Muslim at that time who knew about the meeting was the uncle of Rasulullah Sun Abbas. And so he comes to the Ansar when they're finalizing everything and he says, Look, you know, you want to take my nephew and you want to support him, but you have to understand what this means. Of course, the Ansar, they're farmers. So what he tells them, he says that if you take him, you will accept the, the animosity and the fight of all of Arabia upon yourself. Your heads will, become, will, will be separated from your bodies. Your wives will become widows. Your children will become orphans. And your crops will fail. He says to him, he says, look, if you are ready to do this, then fine, take him. And if you're not willing to do this, then you leave him here and we will support him as best we can. Because Abbas, right on this time, is the leader of Banu Hashim. So they come running to Rasulullah. Sallallahu said, Ya Rasulullah this is what your uncle says. And Rasulullah says to them, he says, well, he's telling you the truth. This is exactly what will happen. And so they ask Rasulullah say, Ya Rasulullah what will we get in exchange for this? You know, if we're going to pay this price, what do we get in return? And he tells them calmly, he says, Jannah. Paradise. And if you look at most books, you know, and most authors, they'll say, oh, this is, this is the deal. This was the deal. That they were willing to give their lives and their wealth and their families in lieu of Jannah. But that's, you know, the deal maker isn't what happens before. It's the final word. And what was the final word here? The eldest among them. He stood up and he said, Ya Rasulullah, you know, that's all good. That's fine. <coughs> Jannah is fine. But once all of this comes under your feet, you know, when all of Arabia comes under your feet and Makkah is under your control, then you will leave us. You will come back to your home. And this is when Rasulullah he says to them, he says that no. He says that your blood is my blood, your life is my life. And, and, and your home will be my resting place. And he says to them, he says that, you know, later on he will tell them that if all of the people of the world went in one direction and the Ansar went in another direction, I would go with the people of Ansar. Yeah. 
So when he says this, that I will not leave you when I come to you, after I come to you, I will never leave you. That jump. That jump. This was the deal. This is what this is why they were willing to give their lives and their wealth for. Is that Rasulullah will never leave us. And so that jump. That jump. That jump. The, you know, so, so not only, you know, if you look throughout history, not only did they say this, but they acted upon it. And we look at what they did in Uhud. We look at, at Badr. You know, we look at what, everything that the Ansar did to support Rasulullah Sassam, knowing that this would cost them their lives and their wealth and everything else that they had. But they didn't care. But again, now coming back to the point. You know, you get all of these letters from Kufa that were willing to do this. So Muslim bin Aqil comes to Kufa. He starts gathering support. Thousands of people come and give him allegiance. Oh, yes. We're, we're ready to do this. If he comes here, you know, we will stop at nothing to support him. Whatever he wants, we will do. And so, Muslim bin Aqil, uh, he sends a letter to Imam Hussein al-Islam that, you know, look, all of these people are willing to support you. 40,000 people have given me allegiance in your name. So when word reaches Yazid that, look, this is what's going on here, so he sends a letter to Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad, who at that time is the governor of Basra. And he tells him that you are to go and relieve Nauman bin Bashir of his duties, and you are to stop Imam Hussein al-Islam at all costs. And you will be given the governorship of Kufa as well. You know, if you fulfill this mission, then you will not only be the governor of Basra, you will also be the governor of Kufa. And the reason these governorships were so important to all these to these people was that they then controlled the wealth of that area. So, so you now he's going to become not only the governor of Basra, which was a wealthy province, but also of Kufa, which is also a trade city. And you, know, you have all of these trade channels that come through Kufa, so more wealth. And so he heads out from Basra with a handful of men. They dress up as the people of Hijaz. And in the middle of the night, they enter the city. And when the people see, you know, of course it's the middle of the night, few people are roaming the streets and they see them and everybody thinks, oh, this is Imam Hussein al-Islam. Because that's what they're dressed, they're dressed up as the people of Hijaz and they knew Imam Hussein al-Islam should be coming because Muslim bin Aqil has sent him the letter that everything's good, come on. And then he goes to the governor's house, Noman bin Bashir, his house, and he knocks on the door. And Noman bin Bashir doesn't open the door immediately. 
Because he also thinks that it's Imam Hussein and Islam who's come. Because who else is going to be knocking at his door at this time of the night? And he says from the inside, he says, look, you know, you are the grandson of Rasulullah and I do not oppose you, but it's not good that you've come here because the situation will get bad. And as I said, he is the governor of the king of Banu Umayyah. And so now Ibn Ziyad uncloaks himself and he says, this is who I am and you are relieved of your duty. Leave. Kicks him out of the house, he takes over now. And the first thing that he does is that he captures the leaders of the main households of Kufa. He calls them to the governor's house and then he imprisons them. And so word gets out that, oh, you know, he's done this. So, and Muslim bin Aqil is told that this is what he's, you know, Ibn Ziyad has come and he's taken over and this is what he's doing. So now, you know, we need to, you know, so something has to be done. He's taken our, our, our leaders, you know, the people that will be the forefront of the support of Imam Hussein al-Islam when he comes. And so, 40,000 men all set out with Muslim bin Aqil and they go in front of the governor's house and they call out Ibn Ziyad and Ibn Ziyad comes out and they demand that he leave you know that he turn release the prisoners and leave and Ibn Ziyad he brings the prisoners out and he tells them that look if you do not leave I will execute them oh. And as we've said, Ibn Ziyad is a ruthless man, known for his, you know, his oppression. And so Muslim bin Aqil is on the forefront, and you have all of these people standing behind him. And there's conversation going on here. You know, demands are made from this side that you do this, and opposition is saying, no, we're not going to do this. And by the time Muslim bin Aqil Radion turns around, there's nobody. Everybody has abandoned him. Words again are cheap. So all of these people had promised to give their lives and their wealth for this cause. But when it came time to pay a price, Everybody's gone. So when he sees this, uh, Muslim bin Aqil also, he drifts away. And he takes refuge in a house of, of one of the people there. Who And eventually he will be, and of course, Ibn Zayd, he doesn't arrest him immediately, but he, after he leaves, he puts a price on his head and we want him. And shortly thereafter, of course, again, you have spies everywhere and people willing to take, you know, a few pennies you know, to divulge information. And so they find out where he's staying, they arrest him, and they bring him to the governor's mansion. And eventually, you know, they torture him and do various things. Time is ending today, so I'm going to stop here. Uh, we'll talk about what happens next uh, next week, inshallah. Um, and we'll, I'll make some announcements afterwards about today is the 21st of Safar. Uh, and so less than two weeks, and Rabbi Allah will, will start, inshallah. Rabbi al Nur. So you know, we need to uh, prepare ourselves for that as well, inshallah. Uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us understand all of this uh, and and the only way to really understand it is with his love and the love of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam so may he fill our hearts with his love and the love of his beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam his family, his companions and all of those whom they love inshallah those who have not made sunnah go ahead and make sunnah inshallah